Hi, I'm Kathy. Hi, <laughs> um, This is a core conversation, and the, it has two topics in this time slot. One of them is patch reviews, how to get people to review your patch, and also how to do a patch review, some of the tools that we use to do that, some improvements that we need to make to the tools, and the second uh, topic that we will talk about after a break in the middle is uh, mentoring mentors, how to turn regular people into mentors of mentors. And because this is a core conversation, uh, the format is a short uh, presentation and then a long time for discussion and questions. So my goal is to do 15 minutes presentation, 15 minute questions, 15 minute presentation, 15 minute questions. I won't make my goal, so you guys should like beat me when I get to like close to 15 minutes. So my name is Kathy. Uh, oh, and so if, if you want to stay for only one of those topics, that's fine. And if you want to switch rooms, that's also totally okay, really is. Um, so my name is Kathy. I'm YesCT on Drupal.org. I'm also YesCT on Twitter, so you can tweet at me at, during the talk or after the talk. I review patches quite often, uh, mostly in core, but the topics also are going to apply in part to uh, contrib and maybe also to other projects that you have uh, even outside of the um, Drupal program itself. I do some other stuff like plan sprints. I really like to plan sprints and I love going to them. So for example, Friday, I uh, spend a lot of time asking other people to do things so that Friday happens. Uh, and I do some things to make Friday happen. Also, you should all come on Friday. Friday, sprint day. I also have a part-time job. I work for Compress, which is a company in Hamburg, Germany. They're a, a small Drupal shop of about 20 people. And my job for them is to work on core. So they pay me 15 hours a week, uh, which I split between actually working on core and blogging about working on core. And, uh, and then usually I also can't stop working on core, so then I keep going even if they don't pay me. Uh, so a little bit about the process and why reviews are so important. Webchick has this awesome uh, talk that she gives and there's a video recording of it, a YouTube video. Um, there's a tiny URL, a webchick-how, and this is one of uh, the slides in her talk. And it shows that we can't solve any problem that we have by ourselves. We need somebody to report the bug in a way that makes sense and we can understand it. We need somebody to produce a patch to fix the bug. We need more people to try and document more things about how to reproduce the bug. We also need somebody to review the proposed solution, which they'll find problems with, which we get a new solution. Then we need another review and another new solution and another review, and it goes on like that. And if we don't have reviews, we don't get anywhere in the process. That's important both for the people who make the patch. They want their work not to go to waste. You shouldn't sit there in the issue queue forever and not do anything. And it's also important for um, the people who are doing the reviews to know that they are really important in the process. After it goes through a period of community review, when the community thinks it's good, somebody will be bold enough to mark it reviewed and tested by the community. That's when a core committer sees it. They will review it. If they have a problem with it, they'll set it back to needs work. So there's no danger in reviewing something because there's always somebody else that's going to check it after you too. You just do the best you can. It's a big problem space. We have 1,500 open issues uh, that need review. Not all our issues. We have like 15, like, I don't know, 10,000 or a lot of issues. 1,500 of them, that's 20% need review. So first, 
it's an interesting uh, order, but first we're going to talk about how to get patch reviews. <clears throat> if you make a patch, when you post the patch, it's very helpful to be specific about the kind of review that you need. Usually you set the status to needs review <laughs> and what kind of review. Uh, so you might add a comment when you post your patch like, uh, I'm just putting up this half done thing because I want to get initial feedback on the approach. That's really helpful for somebody who finds the issue needs review. They know what kind of review to give. Or you think you're totally done. You're like, I really think this is great, but I need a JavaScript person to look at it. So now you know what kind of review. So when you post your review, tell people what kind. You can do that in words, in a comment, and you can also use tags. There's some really common tags that we use in our issue queues, and these are some examples of them. Uh, they usually start with needs. So needs JavaScript review, needs a usability review, needs manual testing. When you produce a patch, you worked really hard on it and you invested time in it and you don't, want it go, you don't want it to go to waste. If somebody finds your issue because they saw its needs review status and they saw that it needs a JavaScript review and they can do JavaScript reviews, you've got a potential reviewer looking at your issue. You don't want them to leave because they can't understand what the problem is or why your approach is a good approach. In order to keep a reviewer looking at your issue, it's very helpful to update the issue summary. Make sure that there are a clear description of the problem, steps to be able to reproduce the problem, and a description of your approach. Maybe if other approaches were discussed, why they were uh, not the one that was chosen. And this should be a summary. So easy to read, five minutes, to the point. Steps to reproduce for people who are going to test or review your patch should start with install Drupal 7 or install Drupal 8. Number one step. You have to be really clear step by step, and they should be numbered. If you add a needs tags, like uh, needs screenshot, it turns out for almost, for a bunch of the needs tags, the community has instructions written down that tell people how to do that. So we have instructions written down for how to manually test something. We have instructions written down for how to review an issue technically. But those instructions are hidden in a docs page tucked in a corner somewhere on drupal.org. So I think it would be really great if when we added needs tags to things, automatically drupal.org added the link to the instructions to the issue. So this is a mock-up of how that might look. If you know anything about usability and <laughs> can tell me if this is usable or not, uh, that would be great. So um, there's both an issue in the drupal.org kind of infrastructure customizations issue queue, and there's also one in Dreaditor. And we can make this happen either of those ways, and there's pluses and minuses to doing that. Uh, but the idea here is that um, the link is the link to how to do the thing, and then uh, paired with the link is the tag so that it's clear to the person looking at it how that link got put there. So the backport a Drupal core patch link to the instructions for how to do that is there because it was tagged needs backport. So there you go. So that would be really great, and we have issues in the queues, you can start to work on that to make that happen right away. Oh, I should, here's a close-up so you can see it better. Uh, so the issue on drupal.org is 2013222, -2 and the issue in the Dreaditor GitHub issue queue is issue 16. So these instructions are, are all kind of named with a pattern. We call them contributor task documents. Um, there's a list of them at drupal.org slash contributor dash tasks slash uh, review. Oh, that's an example of one. If you go to that one, 
um, it, they're all grouped there in the right-hand sidebar. So you can see all of the different ones that exist that we've written. Uh, anybody can add a new one. So if you know of a needs tags that's missing one, you can see how to improve the documentation, the kind of system that we use, and you can go ahead and add one. You can also edit them to improve them. You don't need special permission to do that. Um, feel free. If, if you have produced a patch and you want to review, it's r because we don't have those issues solved yet for how to automatically add these instructions, it's very helpful if you find the doc, cut and paste the link, put it in a comment on the issue so people who find your issue can actually do the review that you so desperately want. If we don't get reviews quickly, the patches go stale and then we make more work for ourselves because we have to either fix it because core has changed wildly in terms of approach or it's just moved a little bit and we have to reroll it. But you don't want to do that as a patch producer. You want to get somebody to review it when it's fresh. It's less work for you that way. If you are creating patches that are similar or you need to create a bunch of patches that are similar, grouping them together under a meta issue actually helps you get reviews because you can have a new person find the meta issue. If you put really great instructions in the meta for how to do a review, because it might be like a very special topic, like perhaps it's about schemas or it might be about um, undefined uh, unused variables, we have a meta for that. You put very specific instructions in the meta. Somebody who finds an issue, it's linked to the meta, or they find a meta, it's linked to the issue. They'll see those instructions. Maybe they'll review one of them. Well, if there's a hundred issues like that, and you've written down really great instructions, they're going to do a couple more. They're going to review another one, maybe three or four of them. Then they'll go on and do something else. So if you have something that's very similar, Documenting the instructions for how to do it makes it so other people will do what you need them to do, which is to review. Um, if you've made a patch, if you've produced a patch, and you want somebody to test it, but the audience of testers, of reviewers that you need, is <clears throat> doesn't have the Dreaditor plugin installed for whatever reason. Perhaps they're on a device that can't have Dreaditor um, or they don't know about it. You can also build a custom URL to simply test me and you can post that either in the issue summary or in a comment. And when you do that, it enables people to uh, test a patch without having a local environment. So simply test me lives in the cloud you tell it which projects, which module, you tell it which patch you want applied to it, and then anybody can <laughs> test a patch. And they can test it on their phone, when they're on the train, um, if, they, it's, if they can't use a certain kind of device, but they can use another one. This is all hosted in the cloud, and all they need is the URL that you send them. You can tweet the URL, you can mail it to them. It's really super uh, handy. Another way to get people to review your things is to give reviews, like literally in terms of a trade. You can just say, hey, I really need somebody to review this. I'm willing to do anything. I'll even review one of your patches. And um, that works, but whether or not you have a one-to-one -one trade, the more you give reviews, the better reviews that you're going to get back in return because there's going to be more examples of good reviews out there. People tend to, tend to repeat the patterns that they see happen over and over again. Not everybody's going to read the instruction, the contributor task document, on how to do a review. What they're going to do is read the issues, read, read, read. They're going to get brave enough one day to do a review, and they're just going to repeat what they saw other people posting. So if they see people posting incomplete reviews or reviews that just say looks good or they just people just mark things RTBC, that they're going to think that's the way to do it. So we can actually improve the quality of reviews that we get by giving quality reviews. So there's more good examples out there. These things, these approaches that patch producers can do actually are accomplishing the goal of helping people find their issue that needs review. So you market needs review, that helps them find it. You tag it with tags, that helps them uh, 
make sure their skills are going to be useful on that thing, making these easy links, and these instructions are all making it easy for people to find uh, how to do it. So if you think that you might want to review something, and I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that, what you want to do in terms of selecting uh, something to review is you want to look for something that's really simple the first time. You can look for uh, not things that are tagged novice, and if you're an IRC, you can ask the question novice. Um, and you can look for initiatives. Uh, they will often have a list of things that they think need a review. Uh, you can also ask them. You can say, I'm new, I want to review something. Do you have anything good for a novice to review? And usually, uh, initiatives have some way of bringing people in, and they will help match you up with an issue. In IRC, the bot that lives there answers these questions. These other questions are helpful, too, in terms of finding issues to review metas and focus. So when you log into D.O, you can find issues to review using the novice link that's in your dashboard. It takes you to a page that is, searches all things. And it's just an active search of issues, but that have the novice tag on them. If you're looking for something to review, you can use this advanced search to customize this. You can select only things that have status needs review. Maybe you want Drupal 8 things. Perhaps you want to work inside a particular initiative. So you can tell the needs tags filter you would like all of both novice and maybe D8MI if that's the tag for the initiative you're interested in. <laughs> Initiatives, you can find out more about them on drupal.org, uh, community dat initiatives slash Drupal dash core. For example, here's what the views uh, initiative page looks like. The cool thing about this is it doesn't matter exactly what issues are listed here. You can click on a couple of them and figure out what are the common tags that you're, they're using with the issues that they're kind of working on right now. So you just need to find anything that somebody's working on, see what tags they're using, and then search for some more issues with those tags. Sometimes issues have a lot of tags. Other initiatives have hubs instead of a list of issues on that page. So um, there's a link in the multilingual section to the multilingual hub, which has a focus board on it that we use to organize our initiatives because I'm part of multilingual. But other initiatives use focus boards too. So if you're in IRC, you can ask the robot focus, and it will tell you the focus boards for lots of initiatives. If you want to work on one of those meta issues where it has really good review instructions and you want to kind of be productive, even though you don't know all of Drupal 8, you're like, well, at least if I learn about this one topic in this meta, there's a lot of sub-issues. I can do a bunch of them. You can feel really productive then. So you can ask it metas, and it'll help you find them uh, some meta issues. Uh, so there's a, the entity field API focus board is there too. <coughs> so. I'm out of my 15 minutes. Uh, when you're giving your review, it's really important that we're constructive because you could be reviewing somebody's first patch. So we need to be very supportive and make it so that when they make a future patch, they make it better the next time. But we do it in a nice way. So we're very specific in our feedback. We include links to resources and standards. Um, it's enough to ask a question. You don't have to say whether or not they've used the right approach. You can ask a question about the approach. And the idea is to scale the community so that we all improve together. Dreaditor is a very handy tool. It's no longer on D.O. It's on GitHub. You want to delete it out of your browser. It's a browser plugin. And then use their nice, just easy click button to install it. When you find an issue you want to review, please follow it because you will lose issues. Issues get lost. They're like poor little puppies. We have to keep track of them. They might have a good issue summary if the patch producer has updated it, which identifies the problem very specifically. They should have steps to reproduce. If they do, you should thank them and also follow them. Simply test me is a good tool to help with that. My tip here is to register. If you don't register, your example of your patch Drupal 8 in the cloud only lasts 30 minutes, but you register and you get more. No and it's free. <laughs> the, way you, the way you use it, um, these are quick, but they'll save you a little confusion. You type Drupal in the search, pick Drupal core. 
you want d8, you want, a, you want d8, no, you want 8.x, which is the bottom of the longest drop down in the world, because you always want to test on head. Don't test on the last alpha, it's weeks old. We've, pff, we're not like that at all anymore. You gotta, you gotta be on 8.x. Uh, I like this tool, Jing, lives in the corner of my computer and it's really easy to make screenshots. It has this cool markup tool. I will usually, anything that affects the UI has to have a before and after screenshot posted in a review. It's also nice to post in the issue summary. Sometimes, even if something doesn't say that it affects the UI, I like to try the patch because nobody ever actually tries it. So it's good to just try things in the UI and post screenshots uh, before and after. Jing is a good tool. When you have Dreaditor, it's really cool. You get these review and simply test me buttons. You always want to use the most recent patch on an issue. And this can be confusing if you're new because it can be like 20 patches. Which one should you test? Scroll all the way down to the bottom. You want to test the most recent one. You want to find out whether or not it works. It's not doing too much. It doesn't break anything. The Simply Test Me button is awesome. It's really easy. But if you need to test it locally, it's nice to right click, copy the link address. You can curl it down or wget it. Apply it. I like git apply minus minus index and the patch name. And I like to commit it right away because a lot of times what happens is if I'm doing a review, I will find some little things that need to be fixed. If I've committed the patch, I can go ahead and fix them when I find them. And then it's really easy to do my inner diff because I'm diffing against what I've just committed. It used to be like last month, a couple months ago, I would apply the patch. I would forget to commit it. I would fix a bunch of things and then I'm like, oh crap. Now I have to make another branch, apply the patch in there and then diff against this branch, against that branch. So download the patch, apply it, commit it, then make your changes. Or do whatever you want, it's just fine. Um, uh, the other nice thing that Dreaditor gives you when you attach your screenshots is an embed link, which puts the image tags right in there. You want to say, when you write up your review, how you did the review, in case there's another patch posted later on the issue, you don't have time to do the review, some other new person can come by and do what you did. They'll know how because you wrote down what you did. And you want to say whether or not it works. It's also really great if you can test it without the patch and verify the issue it exists without the patch. The new Dreaditor is awesome. You can, it's just great. Um, you should use it. And the diff stats are kind of cool. I learned about those. Somebody told me about the diff stats. If you're re-rolling, you want to look at the diff stats on the patch, the old patch. You re-roll something, look at the diff stats on your new patch. Gives you a hint about whether or not you've done it right at all. Because if the diff stats are radically different, you probably messed it up. Uh, the other kind of cool thing you can do, like a sanity check, is you can look at your patch and your inner diff and just look at the size of them. And if they're zero bytes, you did it wrong. And if they're the same size, you probably did it wrong. Um, when you do your review, number your points, but you don't have to do that anymore because the new Dreaditor does it for you. So it's really important that we have a strategy for how to deal with these 20% of our issues need review and there's like a bazillion of them. And so the strategy is to scale ourselves. And we do that by clearly explaining our steps even though it seems silly in a comment. Say how you did your review. Say exactly what you did. If you only looked at the code in Dreaditor, say I only looked at the code in Dreaditor. If you only tried it manually, say I only tried it manually. That's really helpful. Oh, and when you're done with your review, it's great if you update the issue summary and if it needed a JavaScript review and you did it, you can remove the tag that says needs JavaScript review. Oh, and there's other things that we don't have time to talk about. But I will, because uh, I can't not. So the problem is, is when you do reviews, you don't want to tell the person all of the things that you found wrong, because it's too overwhelming. You want to tell them only the m minimum stuff that we have to get uh, fixed in order to get the patch into core. The way you know what is the minimum stuff, they're called core gates. So it's drupal.org slash core dash gates. 
If you find something wrong and it doesn't meet one of these core gates, you mark it needs work. If you find something wrong and it's a little nit, don't mark it needs work, just fix it. Submit your own patch. It's really cool then because it's probably something small and then you'll get a core commit mention for doing a review and fixing a small thing. Interdiffs are great. I will tell you about them anytime you want. You can ask me. I, it's fine. Um, and we won't talk about that. Oh, this one is good. Uh, so I got PHP Storm, and it totally rocks. You should get it. Uh, what, it. It identifies problems for you. So you apply the patch, look at it in context, and it'll be like, hey, look at this. It's wrong. And then you can sound all smart when you're like, hey, did you know you did this? And then I have resources in my slides, which I will post um, up on the session talk. So, Abby, yes? Uh, if you want to learn more about Conclusive, I think one of the key things from developers is giving a talk tomorrow. Oh, yes, we will find uh, out. Yeah. There may be a PHP tips or something about PHP storm. Okay, so, hold on. So, um, you guys, sh that's it. So, the point of the, the take-home points here are people who produce patches need to know what reviewers need, and reviewers need to know what to do, and you, you have to kind of work together. So, the topics are, are linked. Um, I want to skip to a particular slide. So uh, if anybody has any questions like about how the review process sucks and what tools we need to improve, there we go. Uh, you, should go you should go to the microphone and complain right now. I think maybe, I'm going to guess nine. Yes. So uh, this was one of the ideas that I had to help improve uh, things. And then I, um, I, have my other I have another idea I'll show you too. I'm going to get it ready while you guys figure out if you want to suggest something or... Uh, I was just going to no, ask, um, if something's gone uh, review RTBC and then um, it's been reviewed by a core committer and it's gone back to needs work, um, but it's only a little thing. Does it then need to go back in to need to review, uh, yes. review by someone else and then? Yes. Because it seems really hard to find reviewers to do things. Um, yes. So, oh, that was, I was a little too close. Um, <laughs> so, right, so w one of the common things, like, when we looked at that, it can take a really long time to get something committed into core. Yeah. It's dedication, it's patience, but it's also teamwork, tag teaming. So you don't have to take something all the way. You can do one of the little steps, um, and then you can ask for help, or you can just hope that somebody helps. Those are actually okay work patterns. But if it's something you care about a lot, sometimes you're like, oh, please, please, <laughs> can we get this in right away? So you can do some things to help with that. If um, a, rev a, a committer marks a previously RTBC patch needs work, and you fix it, and when you mark it needs a review, Make a really good comment there and also update your issue summary. Make it clear that those concerns have been addressed. Say how you addressed them. And when you post your patch, hop in IRC, post a link to the issue, and you could say, I've addressed the concerns of whoever. I'm around for the next two hours. Ping me if you take a look at this and you have any questions. It yeah. needs review. Uh, and make sure you have an interdiff. The core committer said that all you need to do is add a period to your comment and you don't have an interdiff about an RTBC patch, I'm not going to do it. But if they just want to put a period, don't know. Yeah, that's the sort of example I was thinking of. It's a really simple patch that I've just been sitting around with the needs review for a month or so because it's, you know, I added the HTTPS in Drupal, in the link to Drupal. Yeah, it's um, inter it was RTBC, but is now back to needs review. And it's been sitting at needs review for a month. It's just got the extra S added. Yeah, so um, <laughs> when you almost always post an interdiff when you post a new patch. The only time you normally don't is if you're re-rolling. Um, if you're new at re-rolls, 
uh, or it's a complicated reroll, instead of an interdiff, you can copy and paste the conflicts and copy and paste how you resolved the conflict. And that can kind of help somebody evaluate whether or not the reroll is still good. So that can be helpful too. So anything you can do to describe what your changes were in terms of an interdiff, but also words or anything else, that's really helpful. And then actually talking to human beings, that works too. You can tweet out links to your issue. You can go in IRC. You can go to meetups. You can come to sprints. I know it's weird, but sometimes you have to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks. Does anybody have any thoughts about this mock-up here? Do you think it sucks, or it's redundant, or annoying, or it's great? Just go to the mic. It's great. Um, the descriptions might be a little bit redundant. You know, the, 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 I like great parts, but um, having these instructions at hand for the most important or most common tags um, would greatly, um, I think, uh, make it a lot easier to follow up on all those things. Um, for instance, needs tests is a very common tag that is added to a lot of things. And I think if you're a newcomer, uh, writing tests, you know, you have no prior experience with writing them. Um, outside of Drupal, can be daunting. You don't know where to start. Um, this prevents you from having to ask on IRC, etc. Yeah. As an example. Yeah, so that is one of my worries, is I want to kind of reveal how these things get automatically added by kind of noting that they're paired, but then they're also tags, and now they're also over here, and sometimes the names are also very similar. So if anybody has some better I ideas for that. I guess if you if you put it like that, you want to do this using a, a simple checkbox on uh, in the issue summary. But um, yeah, um, take this up with Boyan and Roy from the UX team, for instance. Oh yeah, I should market needs usability review. <laughs> <laughs> there, ask him. Okay, I have another picture I want to show you. You can come up to the screen if you want to see it better. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a pencil drawing. You have to know the issue queue to understand this. When you go to make a new comment, you have the comment box where you write your comment. Right above that, if you have Dreaditor, which you will all have after today if you don't already, um, there's an a, a autocomplete field where you can type in tags like needs, magic, and my proposal here is that next to the needs tags autocomplete, we put a button which says edit tags. When you click the button, over the top of your comment is something, and it has two sections. At the top are the tags that are already on the issue, either with checkboxes that are already checked or with X's on them, so you can just click it to remove a tag instead of having to backspace to remove tags. Um, and then under that section of our tags already on the issue is a curated list of common useful tags that are unchecked. And if you check them and hit update tag button, or cancel, but if you hit the update tag button, what happens is that window goes away, the tags are added to the autocomplete, and if the tag you added has a contributor task document, that gets appended to the end of your comment, pasted into the comment, and then right before you submit your comment, you have the option to take out those automatically added instructions. So this is another proposal. Um, so I'd like to have some feedback on that also. Jess. So last night, um, Kathy was looking at our slides, and we were sitting down in the lobby of the hotel and having some beverages. and. Um, Alex Pott looked at the, at the slide and commented and said, well, it was talking about how tags was a bad idea. Yeah. And I yelled at him. I was like, screw you. You know, we, we worked with what we had, and, and I think that we solved a problem that was there. But that said, the Drupal 7 upgrade of Drupal.org is imminent, apparently. And in, in that upgrade, there's things like fields. <laughs> so... We could have, like, I mean, these, these needs tags that we came up with, that the like, things that you have to do that are part of the process of developing a patch, that's not really the same as something like 
tagging something for the web services initiative or, you know. So, I mean, maybe something to consider is, and, you know, in consultation with designers and in the fullness of time and so forth, is, you know, is, is there a better way that we can expose our process as a separate field? I mean, there's already too many fields, but at the same time, <laughs> not enough. And I don't know, I'm, I don't know anything about usability, but that's one thing to keep in mind. It, and does, seem, it does seem like the needs tags are, they're there are different kinds of, of tags. Yeah, for sure. It is. You no, know, it's a subset it's of, of needs both review. needs work and, and needs, needs review, review yes. which is very tricky, which is the other thing that can be frustrating for new contributors sometimes is they don't know which status to pick because, in fact, issues are in both states. And one of the ways that um, more experienced contributors can help make that clear is in the issue summary, there's a very common section that people add sometimes, which is called remaining tasks. So in the remaining tasks section, what we can do is number them, identify each item. So we can say it needs a JavaScript review, but it needs work to address the concern by Alex Pot. And that remaining tasks list is handwritten by a human, expresses the idea that something might be in both a state of needing review and needs work at the same time related to what I said before, and this idea of being able to do new things with Project Issue for the first time in a long time. Um, tomorrow night. Yay! Tomorrow night. Um, so like I said about the Drupal.org D7 upgrade being imminent, and we're, we're, so we, we were talking about <laughs> We're looking we're, at we're Neil, <laughs> because Neil is working very hard we're, we're, on we're, it. So we're talking about tomorrow. So, so it would be really great if people you know, could like beta test it. And so we're talking about tomorrow night in the lobby of the Corinthia. Right, Wednesday night. Wednesday night in the lobby of the Corinthia, having a Drupal.org user testing slash drinking slash music party festathon fun time. So, so yes, if we you have, have ideas about usability, if you like using issue queues, if you're good at breaking things, like you should come and hang out and test Drupal.org and have a few drinks because the best usability testing is done with alcohol. I mean, right? Like if after, after I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to promote alcoholism. If you don't drink, that's fine too. You can have a tea and enjoy the music, which also inspires you to pay less attention, focus on just what's most noticeable. So I, it'd be great if anyone wants to help out with that. Yes. Um, there could be a guitar and a ukulele, and I may write my review as lyrics. So yeah. it's going to so be you should fun. Check it out. And, and Angie's be with putting your a friends, event up. and everybody should come Corinthia Wednesday night so we can review the new Ddato interface. Okay, so let's do um, one more question, and then we have to talk about how to turn regular people into mentors. Okay. Um, to as a follow up on those status thingies and that needs work and needs review, for instance, um, an issue can be both states. One of the things that has been annoying me a lot is that whenever you post a patch and you set it to needs review and you want people to look at it, the test bot does it as well. And then it says, no, your patch fails, slams it back into needs work, and then nobody will look at it anymore, even though you just want the review for the approach you took. Ooh, that's a good point. Somebody write that down. Do not patch. In the very, very oh, if you right. don't want, well, no, that's well, if you know you don't. But that's, it's just, it's both needs work and needs review right, at the same but time. If you want a human to give you some advice on and your the approach, test separately. but it also doesn't work, so it needs work. Yeah. I, I want the test review to see, does it break any tests? And I want the human review to see, okay, is this approach acceptable? Is, does this approach solve the problem? Which is one case and where the needs tags the are kind of handy, because the test bot might mark it needs work, but you can still have it needs usability review. Right, because it kicks it back. We just to needs work, people, you, people use that issue statuses. I know, but it's filter. a human doing it. So, okay, that definitely, we should think about that. Somebody should make an issue. Oh, okay, so um, if we, yeah, so a human being after the test bot comes back and says it fails the test, you can still set it back to needs review. I would recommend when you do that in a comment, say what kind of review you're looking for. Uh, I, I, Another thought about crazy um, workflow things regarding this, uh, reviewing, is let's, we have computers that can do things for us. The problem is that we need the humans to program them to do them for us. So not everything is reasonable. But there is one idea floating around. If a patch is submitted and it has certain characteristics, like it changes any file that is a .js, that Drupal.org should be smart enough to know 
that that needs a JavaScript review. Or if it changes CSS, that it needs a CSS review. Because those are sometimes uh, not capable of being tested by the test bot, and so we might need humans to look at it. The people who produce the patches, especially new people, don't know that if they change a JavaScript file in their patch, that they should tag it with JavaScript or needs JavaScript review. And since we have computers that can detect which files we're changing in our patches, that might be something that we can one day have automatically noted for us. So I, I really want to talk about this other topic also. I can't find the top of my window. No. There it is. It's off. Well, that didn't work. Okay, it's so talk number two. Uh, turning regular people into mentors of mentors. Sustainable core development through the core mentoring program. So we have uh, two topics during this core conversation, and we have some new people in the room. So I'm Kathy. I'm glad you came by. I'm YesCT on Drupal.org, and I'm also, oh, that's a lie. I'm also on Twitter as YesCT. I work for Compress, and they pay me to contribute to core. And it turns out, um, Asking businesses to pay you to work on core might sometimes work. If you want to know how I did that, I can talk to you about it later. And we're going to talk about how people become mentors, because you don't just like come into a community and all of a sudden you are a mentor. If that's interesting to you, please stay. But if you only wanted to hear the review part, it's really OK if you'd rather go do something else. It's all right. So <clears throat> people start out as just a participant in a community. They help do one thing once. They tested a patch. They filed an issue. Those are participants. What we'd really like to do is to scale. So we need to turn a one-time participant into a repeat participant. And in, we can do that by making sure that they feel welcomed, making sure that they have tasks that are well matched to their skills. Finding issues to work on is the hardest thing for a new person to do. Finding a second issue to work on is still hard to do. So we have one way of handling that, which is directing people into core mentoring. And there's IRC, weekly meetings, uh, so people can participate from any uh, part of the world. There's also uh, very commonly now, sprints at camps um, and cons on Friday, and where mentors can talk to somebody, find out what they're good at, and match them up uh, with issues to work on. But not everybody knows that these things are available, so it, we also have to figure out kind of how we can make that more transparent and integrative in the process. Like, how do you find the next issue to work on? Uh, experienced contributors or initiative leads can help with that. If you notice a new person has stumbled upon an issue that you, uh, that you see and they've done something useful on the issue, we can thank them and we can suggest another issue they might find interesting. It sounds like you're being pushy or asking people too much, but they're actually really appreciative when you make a suggestion of a similar issue, of a similar skill, a difficulty level, but maybe a little bit harder, they actually will say, thank you for telling me something to go do. Because they can't find anything to do. Once people are repeat uh, participants, um, we want to turn them into mentors. And we can do this by mentoring in public. Because 
habitual participants are hanging around the community a lot. They're looking at what people are saying in IRC. They're seeing how people are interacting in the issue queues. And when more experienced people or their mentors are around, if they're mentoring in public, in pound Drupal, not in private, but in pound Drupal, or they're doing it actually on an issue, they're doing their mentoring on an issue, they're accidentally training people who aren't mentors. They're the people who are hanging around just working on a lot of issues. They happen to see a conversation take place. And that has like this subtle social change in people's brains, and then all of a sudden they're like, they start to repeat that pattern themselves, even if they don't officially become a mentor. So mentoring in public is really important. Um, this is a picture of a shadowy spy. It's so shadowy, we can't even tell they're there. Um, <clears throat> so when we do that mentoring in public, it's like we're subversively training everybody to be mentors. So we're being a little covert about it. Then people still need a little push though. So they've seen this, they've experienced it, they, they know how it happens. Um, but one day, a mentor will be too busy to do something and what they'll do is just ask somebody to do it. So that happened to me uh, this weekend. Uh, I was mentoring or um, trying to work on something else and mentor at the same time I was just overwhelmed and there was somebody that had been worked had worked on like three issues that day so they were a habitual participant they had been in the room where I was mentoring so they had accidentally seen how to mentor I had unconsciously trained them and I got too busy so I just said to them could you please help this person so I asked them and they did it. And now, voila, they're a mentor. If somebody mentors once, we really want them to like that experience, not be stressed out or scared by it, and become a habitual mentor. So to do that, uh, that impromptu mentor, we can make that conversion happen by remaining a resource for them. So it wasn't like, hey, I want you to mentor this room now, and I'm going to go get lunch and go watch a movie. No, it was, I help these three people. I'm going to be right here. If you get confused or you don't know how to help them, just come ask me. So they're doing this mentoring thing, but I'm going to make sure they have a really good experience and that they feel empowered and capable as a mentor by kind of hanging around and being there in case they get stuck on something. Maybe they turn into a habitual mentor. At the next event they have, they've had this good experience mentoring, they knew they were supported, and they might actually volunteer, find the conference organizer and say, I mentored before at this other sprint, do you need any mentors? And now um, they're gonna become a habitual mentor over and over. And we want those people not to just be mentors, but we need to have them start turning people themselves. It's not enough. We need some people to mentor the mentors. And so the way to do that is if you have a mentor that you've worked with and you see that they're uh, doing a good job at mentoring, you can tell them what they've done good and then a new mentor comes up and, and says, hey, I, I'm a new mentor. I'd like to mentor. You can be like, wait, new mentor? Experienced mentor? Experienced mentor? You're now a mentor of mentors. Would you please go show this new mentor how to use the tools, explain to them some of the things that you've found really helpful when you're dealing with people, and now you have a mentor of mentors. While we're doing all of this stuff, we want to expose how we know how to do things so people don't think that we're magically smart. We show them the resources that we use, how we track things, the cool tricks that we have. We um, support them. We make jokes together, we go out to dinner, we help each other with maybe something that doesn't even involve you know, mentoring directly, um, and you build relationships with people, and then what happens is um, 
they start to want to be in the place where all of this magic happens because it's, it's fun and it's great and they get a lot out of it. Technically, um, socially, and that happens when, uh, when we're nice and when we expose our reasonings. So it's really about people and other people and getting together. So that's a quick overview of some ideas of how to turn regular people, pr not yet participants or just first time participants, one day into being a mentor of mentors. Um, I could tell you quite embarrassing stories about my particular journey along that way um, and all the mistakes that I've made and that would inspire you uh, to see that, um, that you have the qualifications to, in fact, become a mentor of mentors yourself. Um, and I, you can ask me anytime. I would love to tell embarrassing stories about myself. Ah, so um, right now, though, we're going to do questions and suggestions, uh, brainstorm about the process, uh, complain about experiences that you've had and what we might be able to do bit different in the future to make sure that those don't happen. While we're doing that, if you could please find this session uh, on the schedule and uh, give some feedback, uh, that would really help us uh, in future cons decide what topics you find useful or uh, how to make them even more useful for you. So you go um, just to the schedule page and find the talk and there you go. So the questions and answers here. So I want to know if you have any answers um, to any uh, suggestions for new things that we can do and uh, if nobody has any like wild brainstorming great ideas um, you can ask me questions and I can answer those we can actually do them in any order You are so shy. Who's been a mentor at ah, DrupalCon? Yes, who's been? Let's, let's get things started like that. Who's, who's ever um, participated in a mentor sprint as a mentor and helped people get started? I've been a mentor. That's not too many. OK, we have well, a, lot no, of, a, a lot of potential. A, OK, lot wait, wait. Of, hold on. It's a third of the room, and we have maybe 25 people. I'm looking at this as potential, you know? I'm telling for the people who can't see. Um, not everybody can see the room. Who? wants to be or is planning to mentor this week on Friday. Oh, who's mentoring on Friday? So Okay, I, there are a few hands not raised. Why? I'd like to know. So it turns out that we um, have this big sprint on Friday. Hundreds of people are going to come and want to communica uh, communicate. They're going to want to contribute. And we can help make sure that they have a good experience by providing mentors that help them through that process. So that when they go home, they or when they come to the next event, they contribute again. And the cool thing about that is what we end up in the end is a better Drupal because we have people who are helping to make it better. And like, so if you come to a sprint and you fix something, that's cool. That was good. If you come to a sprint and you help eight people fix something and three of those people continue to fix things in the future, you've now become more productive in your work because you fixed three times as many things, even though you haven't fixed anything. So we have all these people coming. We need about 50 mentors, and we have 27 signed up. So the beginning of this talk, where you get some idea for how, uh, maybe you've reviewed things before or produced a patch before, but you, some of these tips, you thought, oh, that's a good tip. So what you can do is you can come to the sprint on Friday, and you can share those tips with people who maybe weren't at this talk, or your own tips with people. And you don't have to go through special training in order to show up on Friday and come up to me and say, Kathy, I was totally inspired by your awesome talk. I'd really like a yellow t-shirt. Can I mentor? We and get a yellow t-shirt? You get a Why yellow t-shirt when you say mentor. Say that in, in the first place. Uh, <laughs> just just one, one question. I, I wonder, maybe it's about the definition of being a mentor because I plan to come on Friday on the sprint and I plan to get some work done or get, uh, get really into it, uh, coding some stuff. And uh, surely I'm going to be supportive if someone beside me needs to set up an Apache or whatever. 
it, does this qualify me as a, as a mentor? Just uh, I will be there and will be supportive, but I won't run around telling anybody. Right. I, I'm the one with the yellow shot. Just ask me. I know barely nothing. Right. What's <laughs> your name? George. George. Um, so that's you have two interesting things that you have brought brought up. Um, one is you're coming to the sprint on Friday. You'd like to get some work done, and you don't mind helping some other people also. One of the things you can do on Friday is you can work half of the day. You can tell me, I'll mentor for the first half, but I really want to get some things done, so after lunch, I'm going to sprint. Or you can do it the other way around. I will say, that's great. Um, the, the other thing is, um, one of the cool, we have extended sprints around cons now. It's kind of a thing. We also have them around big events like bad camp and dev days. And the nice, they're like usually two days before, two days after or something like that. The cool thing about that is like the hardcore people who like just want to work and they can't like, they're like, you know, they just feel bad when they're not working at a sprint. It's a little bit easier to deal with that if you can say to yourself, I can mentor on Friday because I can sprint on Saturday and Sunday. And so Saturday and Sunday, instead of hundreds of people, there's like 50 people, and they're mostly people who know what they're doing, so the, there's, there's not as much need for a mentor, and so people can get more work done. So you might be more willing to mentor on Friday if you were planning to also stay for the sprint on Saturday. It doesn't help you today when your plane leaves on Friday at six o'clock, but at the next DrupalCon or the Dev Days, or bad camp or wherever you are, plan to stay longer than the event. I guarantee you people are sprinting the days before and after. I will be, because I'm mentoring on the day when we do the thing. So um, the other interesting thing that you brought up is what is the definition of a mentor? So for Friday, the definition of when you are mentoring and when you're sprinting, for me, like one of the clear signals is, is Mentors usually are walking around wearing a shirt that easily identifies them as somebody who anybody can bug. So you see a mentor walking around and you're sprinting and you have a question, you know you can interrupt that person and that they will help you. Um, there's another kind of mentor, both on Friday and also always in the community at the same time. And those are camouflaged mentors. They don't wear yellow shirts. They sit at the table next to you working quietly, but are really willing to help you if, you if you just ask them. So I was reviewing this thing and I've never seen this before. Should I, sh should I correct it? Should I mention it? And they'll, this experienced person sitting next to them will totally mentor, right? Like everybody, like, it happens all of the time. In Dries's keynote, when he put those community people up there, Right, he mentioned me for mentoring, but what he didn't mention is all of all those of those are other people up there are mentors. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them, Berdier, mentors all the time, yep. but he doesn't wear a yellow shirt, right? So that's the cool, that's the other cool thing about the, like the covert mentoring, right? Like when you do mentoring in public, people who are participating a lot, they start to pick up these mentoring things and they start to do them. So like when you say like, how do you define mentor? Like it's actually kind of an interesting question. I also wanted to respond to what you said with regard to the point about, you know, I can help people set up an Apache stack, but you know, I don't, I might not know the answers to their other questions and so maybe I can't do the whole mentoring thing. That's wrong, you can, because the most important discovery I think that I made is that you don't have to know everything. You don't even have to know a lot. Um, for I, I, anyone I, I haven't met, um, I'm, I'm Jess, I'm XJM, and I kind of sort of started the core mentoring program. She kind of sort of absolutely did. <laughs> And she met, so she is a mentor of mentors. I'm a mentor of mentors of she, mentors. She turned me <laughs> into a men, like she took me through that process, right? So she's my mentor. So the, the thing is, when I started in 2011, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was such a noob. It was ridiculous how much of a noob I was. But I just was like, I was willing to be wrong. And I, I, I took the things that I didn't know how to do and helped people do those things. And so, like, when you're at a sprint, especially, you know, but also when we do mentoring, did you talk about IRC mentoring when I was late? 
Maybe a little bit. Okay. We have so, IRC mentoring. It's twice a week. You can Google it. Or you can follow <laughs> Drupal Mentoring on Twitter. And I tweet when mentoring hours start. And I also should totally follow Drupal Mentoring. You totally should follow at Drupal Mentoring on Twitter, all one word. Um, so in both those scenarios, you don't, you're like, you can ask other people. Like Kathy said, there are already 27 mentors there. And it's going to be busy and crazy. But on the other hand, both when you do mentoring in person in a sprint, or online, or even in like not a formal setting like we do for mention, but just this like stuff that happens in the issue queue. It's totally okay to be like, you know, I don't know, but I maybe Kathy knows someone who knows the answer, or like, oh, you know, I know that there's this guy over there who's like looks like he's working right now, but it's a really technical question. I think he know the answer to, so let's go there. So it's more about just like help giving someone some someone to ask and then pointing them in the right direction because there's going to be this huge volume of people who are just looking for someone to just give them a nudge. And so if you can give them that nudge and then just say, oh, you know what, I don't know how to answer that question, but let me ask someone else who can and find someone to help you, that is huge. Another thing that, the, um, that Kathy and Andrea did at DrupalCon Portland, which was really valuable, is they had a, a couple people out in front of the sprint who's just spent a couple hours just organizing people, like saying, this is where you need to go. If like asking people, what's your skill set? You know, do you need to set up a dev sec? Oh, you do, then go to the workshop. Oh, you don't, well maybe you want to go in here. And just sort of like coordinating back and forth. They were like they were like greeters and like traffic yeah. cops. See what happens sometimes at a sprint host is at a restaurant. Is people, first of all, don't think that they're smart enough to come to sprints. But what happens is that we talk about it all the time, how much fun it is, and we keep telling them. So eventually, one time, they like walk down the hall towards a sprint, but they're still really nervous. If they don't know where to go or what to do immediately, they leave. I mean, it's tempting, right? Because what is your choice? Hold up in a room where a scary experience, something totally new to you is going to happen that you may not enjoy, or you could go to the castle in Prague, right? Like, <laughs> so it's easy to turn around and just leave, right? Or get up and go. So. Having somebody smile and say, oh, I'm, hi, yes, you're in the right place. This is the sprint. Oh, oh, you've done that, but you haven't done that? I know exactly who you need to talk to and where to go. Come with me, go here. So we don't like put handcuffs on them and like drag them to where they need to go, <laughs> right? Might. We're, we entice don't. them and we make it so easy that why wouldn't you do it, right? And the thing about not being skilled, and I remember like Jess being the maintainer of taxonomy access control. And I remember like, the, I don't know, I see, I remember like you were starting out by like doing like reviews and stuff. And now she can do all these cool things. But the reason she can do all these cool, well, one of the reasons she and I can do more things, way more things than I could before is because I mentored. Because yeah. what happens when you mentor is it forces you kind of like outside of your skills into others. Because I don't talk to a new participant and say, let me tell you what I'm good at mm -hmm. and let me help you find an issue that I know about. Okay, sometimes I do that. But, um, but what I do is I talk to them. So I'm going to talk to somebody who knows something I don't know anything about but I'm the mentor. So then I have to find an issue for them to work on, figure out what the issue needs, because they're not going to solve the whole issue. They're only going to do one part, and we do that together. I can even show them how I find an issue to work on. So I'm exposing that to them, because they don't know. And then together, we have to figure out how to do that thing. And then we have to figure out how to know how to do that thing. And we do it together. And in the end, they're happy because now they know how to go off on their own and how to do all of these things in their area of interest. But I'm accidentally forced to get a new skill. Mm -hmm. And now I know how to do that thing too. But would I have sat down at home by myself and said, you know what, I'm really going to figure out local task routing YAML things. Like, yeah, no, I'm not gonna, like that's not my idea of a fun evening by myself, frustrated when I can't find examples, they don't work, da da da. But somehow, when I mentor somebody who wants to work on that and we're doing it together and we're interacting, I don't, it's just more fun. And now I know these things that I didn't know before and so, you don't have to know a lot when you mentor. You just, you just kind of have to do it. And then yeah. over time, it's amazing. You're, it's like, it's, we say that companies should encourage their employees to contribute because when they contribute to core, their work gets reviewed 
they learn how to do their work better. What, it doesn't matter what it is, you know, mocking uh, UIs or uh, making suggestions about possible solutions or writing code. Whatever you do, somebody's going to point out what you've done wrong. You're going to discuss it. You're going to figure out what was really wrong and how to do it better. And we make that argument for companies all the time for participating. But it turns out the same thing is true for mentoring. Companies can pay their people to mentor. We haven't tried this yet, but I don't know. Com companies can pay their people to mentor, and this, this get, the company gets the same effect. What do they get back when that person returns to work? Somebody who knows a whole heck of a lot about a lot more things. So you don't have to initially know things. You just have to show up. Um, I'm back. Um, for people who didn't know me yet, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Bart Zeno with an X on Drupal.org. Um, I'd like to share three short um, experiences um, from my two times of mentoring at DrupalCons, um, Munich and Portland. One of them you may already have heard in the previous BOF. Um, so I started mentoring in DrupalCon Munich. You have two Munich. minutes. DrupalCon Munich last year. Um, I stayed for the sprints, but I had never touched Drupal 8 before, and there were all these focused groups of people working on views and routing and whatnot. I did not know what to do until Jess started talking about the mentoring sprints, and I thought, well, I know jack shit about Drupal 8, but I know how the review process goes. I've, 